talk about the great strike of 1913 in New Zealand. Um, the reason I wanted to cover this is because I've been talking about a lot of North American strikes. I talked about Winnipeg. I've talked about Seattle and San Francisco, the Boston police strike, Homestead strike, uh, everything that Eugene Debs did, the railroad strikes. Um, you know, so I've gotten a ton of American strikes, but I wanted to see how other countries were handling uh, the labor movement. So uh, the first one that popped up to me that, uh, that I thought was kind of interesting was the Great Strike of 1913, which is really a series of strikes throughout the country, right? Um, and this is particularly in the island nation of New, or uh, New Orleans. Fucking idiot. Um, <laughs> New Zealand. <laughs> the island nation of New Orleans, um, where the whole city was shut down because of Mardi Gras problems. Um, no, New Zealand. Uh, if you don't know what New Zealand looks like, Let's take a look at it. Ba bam! There's New Zealand. Nice little island there. Um, got the map pulled up for you guys. So uh, that's the northern part of the island. That's the southern part of the island. Um, oh, maybe I'll. Oh yeah, I can do that. That's a smart idea, Chris. Good job. Good job using the the zoom feature on the map there. Um, so that's the island there. And we're going to talk about, you know, when, when we get to these strikes, because it happens in multiple different parts, I will uh, show you exactly where, you know, these strikes are happening and why certain aspects of them are, were, were important the way that they were. Um, so um, this really starts in 1890, uh, where uh, there were a bunch of maritime strikers and, uh, and, they, and they unfortunately got defeated, right? Um, there was a lot of violence involved and uh, the unions just weren't able to hold up. So they backed down. They lost a lot of power. They lost a lot of funding. Uh, so 1890, the unions are kind of in a rocky position in New Zealand. By 1894, uh, the Minister of Labor, William Pemberton Reeves. I love these names. They're fucking amazing. Um, he created the Industrial Conciliation and Arbitration Act, which basically uh, made it compulsory. Uh, and I'm using the word compulsory because I don't get to use that word very often. Fucking great word. Uh, but it made, the, made it compulsory, made it mandatory for employers to uh, arbitrate. Uh, arbitration became a mandatory thing um, between unions and employers, right? So, so the unions were kind of absorbed under this arbitration act, um, and the employers had to comply. Uh, and what this act really did was it outlawed employer lockouts, um, and union-related strikes. So employer lockouts, uh, if you remember from yesterday's, um, yesterday's talk about the homestead strike, um, you know, Henry Frick locked out the, the workers uh, that were associated with the unions. Well, really all the workers, because the unions were representing all the workers and hired uh, strike breakers that he was secretly bringing in with um, the help of, you know, the, the, the Pinkerton Detective Agency, which is basically hired guns, right? Um, so... In 1894, in New Zealand, they outlawed that. They basically say, you can't do that. You have to negotiate. You have to sit down with the unions. And the unions can't do what, you know, what their, their kind of tool is, their, their strongest tactic is, which is strikes, right? So the unions weren't able to strike. Now, part of this is because this kind of gave unions a little bit more strength back, um, especially in a time where they didn't have that much strength, right? Because they got defeated four years earlier. And it was basically an act that made uh, collective bargaining into a law. Um, and it was arbitrated by, you know, this, this particular act, this particular committee, um, where it, it, forced, it, it forced people to, to listen to each other. Um, and in theory, it sounds really fucking great. And for a little while, it worked. It was kind of going okay. Um, and the only unions that were able to directly uh, negotiate with the workers that were allowed to strike were uh, the unions that were already part of the Trade Union Act. They were allowed to strike, right? So, the, so there were a couple unions in New Zealand that... Um, were part of the Trade Union Act that got kind of grandfathered over into being able to continue striking, being able to uh, stand up for the worker and use the strike as a tool uh, when negotiations failed. But there weren't a lot of unions that were part of that. 
Um, that was, you know, that was kind of a rarity at that time. And, you know, to a lot of people, um, when this, uh, when this arbitration act was put into place, this was a win for them. This was a win for unions that were uh, demoralized, defunded. This was a win for the working class people because they finally felt like, you know, uh, because it was basically a collective bargaining law that was put into place, they felt like the government was on their side. They were actually being represented uh, by, by their government and state officials. Uh, and it was a win for the employers because, you know, the employers get to, um, you know, essentially continue making money. That was, that was sort of the win for them. So it seemed like this was going to be, this is going to be a very easy, peaceful way of resolving any sort of labor movement issues that were going to come up. Now, by 1908, which was uh, about 14 years after this act is put into place, the workers were pretty much done with it. Um, they kind of didn't feel like they were getting a whole lot out of this act anymore. You know, they were they were just like, no, nah, we're, we're not, we ain't getting shit. We keep getting screwed over. Everything is, nothing has really changed. Um, so there was no increase in pay. There was no overtime. There was no betterment of work conditions. And these are basically the things that they kept asking for. They kept saying like, hey, our work conditions aren't great. Our hours are not great. Our, um, you know, we don't have any overtime. Like we're not getting paid for overtime, which is crazy. Uh, and so they would arbitrate. And then nothing would happen. Um, so, because of this, a lot of a lot of workers that you know, a lot, and a lot of unions that were really under the uh, Arbitration Act were were you know like this is bullshit. We're gonna go and join one of these um, trade trade union act unions, the the unions that are allowed to strike because we got to do something here, right? So. A lot of them joined the United Federation of Labor, uh, not to be confused with the United Federation of Planets from Star Trek. Uh, that is a different thing, although possibly, maybe, uh, inspired by this. We may never know. We may never know. <laughs> but uh, the United Federation of Labor... Uh, was a labor organization that was um, able to strike, grandfathered by the uh, Trade Union Act, and um, they got nicknamed the Red Fed. The Red Federation is what uh, what people started calling the UFL, uh, the United Federation of Labor. The Red Fed is what they kept calling them. And part of the reason was because they were talking about a lot of socialist movements. They were talking about you know, things that they were uh, seeing happen in other countries. So there were a bunch of uh, members that were inspired by the Socialist Party of America, which was um, uh, the, the party that was started by one Eugene Debs that ran uh, under the Socialist Party of America five times, um, you know, really kind of hitting a blow towards the Democratic Party and Woodrow Wilson who was, you know, implementing things like the Espionage Act and this hyper-nationalization um, during World War I uh, that he opposed of, um, you know, was kind of stagnating wages and things of that sort. And um, some of the members of the UFL saw how Debs was going about doing things, the philosophies that Debs was talking about. And they, um, they took all that and they came back to New Zealand and they were like, we'll implement that. So, and then... Um, a lot of other people were also members of the International Workers of the World, the IWW, right? Um, so they were they were part of the IWW. The IWW arguably is a little bit more militant than the Socialist Party of America, than really even what the, the UFL uh, was. Um, they were really about direct action. They were really about showing that, you know, the workers aren't going to be uh, push around as much. So, um, you know, so because of these two ideologies, this term red fed kind of came around. Um, uh, I, I don't know if it was a term of endearment. I, I, I genuinely doubt that it was. I genuinely doubt it. <laughs> like, I feel like this was like a fuck you to them. So things started kind of popping off. Um, as these workers are leaving the Arbitration Act, joining the UFL. We get to 1912, uh, to the Wahihi strike. 
Um, I don't know if I'm actually pronouncing that right. I wonder if I can find it on the map. Uh, maybe I can if I get close. Um, of where is Wahihi? This happened in 1912. Uh, I might not be able to find it, by the way. This might be, this might just be me putzing around a map and not being able to find it very well. Uh, it's Queenstown, there's Wellington, Napier. If I can't find it, I can't find it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I did my best, you guys. I did my best. Um, but, um, that why he he I, I why he why he strike why he strike i'm i'm sorry if i'm butchering the name of it uh but this happened in 1912 and i mean this was a direct violent strike right the 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 uh workers went on strike and then the conservative uh the conservative reform leader william massey who had come into power just you know a year or two earlier basically used the police force and defeated the strikers so just straight up, they were like, hey, we're declaring a strike. And this guy was like, great, we're going to shoot you in the face. Um, and it's like, wait, what? <laughs> we just want to talk. Good. Talk to our guns. Okay, you got these guns. That's what you're going to talk to. We're locked and loaded, motherfucker. <laughs> right? Like, that's... So the UFL got criticized by the, by the IWW because they didn't take enough of a direct action. Uh, they were very hesitant on the strike. They were kind of... Like, you know, they, they, they were a little wishy-washy and, and then, you know, the police force came in and uh, because they weren't as forceful as, as the IWW thought they should be, um, you know, they got blamed for, for letting the strike kind of dissolve in a matter of seconds. So that happens in 1912 and then a year later is when things pop off with the Great Strike, where in October of 1913, after... Um, you know, not being treated well after not being heard, after the Arbitration Act constantly failing them over and over again. More and more people are joining the UFL. The UFL basically goes, all right, we got to do it. We got to get this strike going. And um, it started with coal miners, shipyard workers, uh, water siders, and they all started striking. Um, and, you know, the, the employers of these things were trying to negotiate, uh, and they kept saying, look, we'll negotiate with you but we really need to, um, what we really need to do is go back to the Arbitration Act. We got to let the Arbitration Act do what it was meant to do. Uh, and the reason why the employers were saying that is because, well, the Arbitration Act was, you know, on their behalf. Uh, the Arbitration Act had uh, basically given the employers everything that they wanted. They were negotiating on behalf of the employers. So the notion of uh, well, it seems like the government is actually siding with the people by making this collective bargaining uh, law uh, was barely anything for the people. It just brought people to the negotiating table to be like, look, look, here's the rights we're going to take away from you. Do you guys see this? And it's gone now, right? Like the government was siding with these employers and these corporations more than they were with the, um, with the people. And... Um, some of the unions um, didn't really particularly care to do a strike. Uh, they were not excited um, about striking. They thought it was the wrong time because it was the wrong season to strike. Um, it was October, uh, and it was a slow season for coal mining and shipyards and water siding and stuff like that. So, um, you know, they were like, this is... If you guys strike, they're just going to get other people because it's also slow farming season. So there's a bunch of farmers that don't really have that much to do on their farms that are going to join and become scabs. So like this strike doesn't seem like it's timed very well. Um, you know, and really where things were starting uh, at the very beginning of this in October of 1913 was in Auckland and Wellington, the Northern Islands. So I do know where that one is. Uh, so we're, we're looking at the Northern Islands up at the top here. So, uh, you know, there you can see Auckland at the very top. You can see Wellington um, there. Uh, you know, so we're looking at 
you can see that there's a lot of coastal areas, Wellington specifically and Auckland specifically, coastal areas, and then basically the people from the center would be the farmers that would come out to these uh, coastal towns and become scabs. They would become scabs for these people. And that was a concern for them, um, you know, because they were also out of work. So, but what was different about this is um, that the farmers weren't used as scabs. Um, they were actually used to defer um, actual military action. They deputized the farmers. The government and the military deputized a bunch of these farmers, um, and they basically said if the military shows up or if the cops show up, it's not going to look good because they're peaceably striking, they are making speeches, they are organizing, and they're doing all these things. It's going to make us look like a bunch of fucking assholes if we show up with the, you know, with the HMS and point cannons at these people. Uh, so let's deputize these farmers that don't have anything to do and send them out to take care of it. So we'll, we'll take one side of the working class, right? Because the farmers union uh, wasn't on the UFL side. They weren't on the IWW side. Um, they thought their actions were too over the top. And uh, they actually wanted to go back to the Arbitration Act. So because they were, they, even the farmer union was on the Arbitration Act side, uh, they basically went and they were like, yes, we'll do it. You know, we, we need the extra money. We're going to go ahead and um, become deputized and take care of them. So they called them specials. Um, and what's funny is, so this is basically Pinkertons, right? The Pinkertons were, woo, like if you remember from yesterday, we talked about the Pinkertons. We were talking about they were kids. They were students. They were out of work, you know, men trying to feed their family for two fifty a day. Um, and, the, and they did the same thing in Winnipeg in 1919, the specials. Right. They they deputized a bunch of out of work people. They deputized a bunch of students and kids um, and they called them specials and they went out and they fought alongside the, the police force and essentially to try to boast their numbers and to, to pad their numbers. Um, and, you know, when in, in New Zealand, when this happened, I mean, it was it was violent. Um, the specials showed up. They tried to, you know, break up these strikes and, uh, you know, they, they used revolvers. They would start shooting at these strikers. Um, and the strikers had to retaliate. And so they did. And they fought back. Um, it was tougher to take the inner, like the inner island cities, but they did take the wharfs. Uh, so in Auckland, which is where we were looking at here, in Auckland and Wellington specifically, uh, which is the southern part of the northern island and the northern part. So basically those two specific cities, they were able to take the wharfs and they were, um, you know, kind of gaining some ground and gaining some traction. So at this point, um, you know, strike leaders started getting arrested, uh, which is very similar to what they did, what Ole Hansen did in 1919, demoralization. Um, demoralization was usually the first point of tactic for for North American strikes. Uh, this one seems like it's a little different. The New, the New Zealanders were, were uh, the New Zealand government, at least at that time, seemed like they were heading more towards uh, violent uh, attacks uh, than trying to demoralize them. But eventually the, the, the strike leaders did start getting arrested uh, and they started getting arrested around um, the, they, they kept saying that they were uh, you know, getting arrested for sedition. That was the big thing. Oh, it's sedition. We're arresting them because it's sedition. Um, and, you know, if there's any bigger proof of an oligarchical plutocracy, you know, that's, it's, it's calling anybody that is standing up for the working class individuals that's standing up for worker rights and basic human rights in the workplace, uh, a traitor. So if you stand up for the working class and you stand up for basic human rights in the workplace, you're a traitor to the country. I mean, that is basically the oligarchical plutocracy, right? Like, and this happened worldwide, like worldwide, this, this seems to be happening in terms of, in terms of the worker movement is if you stand up for the worker, they're going to call you a traitor, <laughs> you know, red fed, you know, they're going to, uh, lad of Lenin, Bolshevik movement, whatever the fuck it is, they'll, they'll make up these things and, and, um, 
and, and arrest you, essentially. Um, they also arrested them for inflammatory language, uh, which I'd love to fucking hear that inflammatory language, wouldn't you? Like, I would love to have heard some of these speeches that they were giving. Um, because there are some fucking Eugene Deb speeches that I've listened to, and I'm like, and then I get fired up, and I'm like, where, when are we taking the system down? Let's fucking do this shit, right? And then it's just like me in my pajamas, um, and I'm like, maybe I should wear better pants to the revolution, you know? Um, but it does, it kind of fires you up a little bit. Um, but it's one of those things where it's like speaking truth to power gets you arrested, right? It gets you a prison sentence in this situation, even in America, even in America where, where freedom of speech, freedom to peaceably assemble, freedom to criticize your government is all part of your fundamental rights. When it comes down to fighting for the working class, when it comes down to saying that the, the 1%, the rich people, the bosses, the people that run these organizations that aren't treating their employees properly should be held accountable for and should shift their business, uh, business models to treat their employees better that's an arrestable offense. They can't handle a little bit of that truth. That's the problem with the elites. They're just, they're just so fragile that even words will destroy them. You know, they can't handle the truth. The cowards that are afraid of the strength of words is what they are. Because words carry that strength. And they, and they don't have anything that they can say they don't have the fervor, the passion, the drive to really make a concrete argument. Not in the way that Eugene Debs or any of the people in the IWW could. Any of the people, any of these strike leaders could. They're the ones that rally these people. Get them fired up. Get them excited to do some shit. Take action. What are, what are these bosses going to come out and say? Well, I mean, I like money and um i like it when you don't have money and i think that's pretty cool and i think if you don't think that's pretty cool i do have a friend in this military that will fire a cannon at your face um and that's just law you know i'm just doing what the law tells me because i like money and i like it when other people don't have it um, because it makes me feel special because my parents never said that I was special. It was like, boo, boo, and then they throw rocks at him and stuff. I mean, that guy would get booked at virtually every corporate comedy club across the world. <laughs> like, everybody that would do, they'd be like, that guy's going to sell some drinks. You know, that guy's going to fucking sell those shots. So as these union leaders get arrested in Auckland, which is the northernmost part of the island there, um, you know, so we're there. It's that one where you see that one. Um, that's that's where the IWW get involved a lot more. Um, and and they become far more militant. They become far, far more militant. Uh, and they start pushing back against these people real fucking hard. Um so, you know, as, as the violence from the, um, the violence from, from the, the authority, the state increases, uh, the IWW decide to push back on them, right? And in Auckland, what ends up happening, and the reason why they become more militant too, is because the specials attack the strikers and they did, and they covertly attack them. So as they're having a peaceful demonstration, they hit them hard. Right. And, uh, you know, violence breaks out. A bunch of people die. And uh, and so the IWW go, fuck it. Now it's time for a general strike. We got to get everybody involved. Look at what these people did. Uh, you know, they have no code. They have no ethics. They attacked us when we were uh, trying to be peaceful. They attacked us when we were sleeping. This is bullshit. And uh, 6,000 people joined in on that general strike in Auckland. Um, now, the, so the, the southern island, which is down here right uh below wellington you had a lot more of these smaller strikes in smaller towns uh so some of the notable ones were like christchurch uh dunedin and queenstown you know because they are bigger cities they were more notable 
um, than than some of the other smaller ones. But they were having smaller strikes that were happening in these in these things. But in in the southern towns themselves, they were mining towns, and basically the specials that were hired because they're you know not trained military people in the in the southern region itself. Um, the miners, you know, they were kind of like getting tired anyway. Uh, and uh, the government decided that, okay, it's it's time to stop playing softball with these with these specials, with these farmers that aren't, you know, trained law for law enforcement officials and put police opposition in place. And uh, once that happened, uh, the miners in the south and really once it, it started trickling and, you know, miners everywhere, uh, basically wanted to join an Arbitration Act union to go back into the negotiating table with the government um, and the employers. And uh, and that really that was really it. Um, that kind of ended the strike. Once the miners kind of lost their um, tenacity to continue the strike because the cops, the police were now getting involved and these are trained professionals with better weapons, with better training. Uh, you know, they were like, we don't, we're we don't want to see any more people die. Uh, so this overwhelming military action that did end up taking place, the, the violence that was started by the state itself, by the government of New Zealand itself, uh, deputizing and pinning the working class against itself, um, tired out the strikes. And uh, at the end of it, you know, the workers didn't really, again, it kind of ended in the early 1900s because of this authoritarian militaristic force. The workers really didn't get what they what they wanted. They didn't they didn't really get a pay raise or better work conditions or overtime or anything else. Uh, but what it did was um, a couple different things. So the IWW members took what they had learned and took how the you know, how the state does react to things. Um, and they went to Australia with it. But uh, what what this strike really did, in, and this went on from October to January, it took a, it took a couple months, um, is that uh, it fortified the socialist movement and the labor movement in New Zealand. It really kind of gave them a stronghold of uh, how to use legislation uh, to possibly build a, a better frontier. So uh, a lot of the strike leaders, and this is very similar to... Um, to, to what happened in um, uh, in America as well, there was there was a lot of strike leaders that ended up going into government, that ended up going into rep, trying to accurately represent the people as part of the working class, right? Um, the um, the what is it? The Social Democrats and the United Labour Party combined into one, and and they became a really powerful party by 1935 in New Zealand. So, you know, and that was really because a bunch of strike leaders, a bunch of UFL people, and a bunch of IWW people decided to go into the government and, and decide to, you know, do something about it. Um, and the big takeaway from all this is, it, you know, look, this is gonna happen. If, if, we, if you strike, there are gonna be, uh, you know, desperate people uh, within the working class that are are unfortunately going to go against their own people and the hope is that they don't the hope is that um, you know you can educate these people enough that you can talk to them that when when they when they reinstate the specials when they reinstate the deputization of uh, of the working class against the working class itself um, that we can look at that and go mm, we've tried this okay you know what maybe we shouldn't maybe maybe this this seems wrong this feels wrong um, you know, not to let that desperation be exploited uh, by those in power. Um, I think that's an important lesson to take away from all this is is that is something that uh, that they do. Uh, so and and really, perhaps the the people that really drive the change are these strike leaders, are these people that know how to organize people um, and and really the the thoughts and processes, and the philosophies of the IWW and the UFL and um, the AFL and the Socialist Party of America, that's what we need to start learning from. That's what we need to start implementing in our society a little bit more. 
uh, because it seems like that's the right direction to go. It seems like that's the right direction to go. Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed this content, please give it a like and a subscribe and a share. Share it out with your friends, your enemies, whoever you think would enjoy content like this. I'm going to be putting out videos like this every single day. So make sure you are subscribed to the channel uh, and make sure you hit that bell so you get all the alerts from all the videos that I put out there. Uh, and, uh, and if you, if you have the means to, uh, please consider making a, a donation. I know we are all in tough times, but if you, if you can, uh, you can become a sustaining member or make a one-time donation at ramennoodlescomedy.com slash donate. You can check out various different ways of becoming a sustaining member or just make a one-time donation. Uh, while you're on my website, you can also check out all of my past comedy albums, which are available on all of your favorite streaming and um, downloading websites, if that's, that's, if that's a way that you can you say that. Uh, <laughs> but they're also available on Bandcamp, which uh, right now is giving the most back to artists. Uh, but also on my Bandcamp, they are all available for a pay what you want. If you would like to enjoy some live stand-up comedy albums from me and you don't have the means, if you're in tough times, that's totally fine. You can download it for free. Go ahead and get it for free and enjoy it. Uh, or if you do, and if you want somebody else to enjoy it, you can get it to them as a gift. Uh, that's also a, a recommended thing. Uh, but most importantly, thank you guys for tuning into this video. Um, thank you guys for, for all the people that have already donated, that have already become patrons. I really appreciate it. You guys are amazing. And uh, until the next video, we'll see you on the road. Thank you, guys.